Frederick Kipling, author of The Jungle Book and many other works, became so famous that at one point, the going rate for each of the words that he wrote in his works was about 10 shillings or $10 for us. Um, and so a group of enterprising college students who weren't exactly fans of uh, Kipling decided that they would have a little fun and send a letter to Rudyard Kipling. And in the letter they, they wrote uh, something along the lines of, Mr. Kipling, uh, could you, for uh, the 10 shillings we have enclosed, please provide us your best word? Very shortly, uh, they received a letter back from Rudyard Kipling, uh, and, it, and in it he had written one word to them, thanks. As we approach this portion of the holiday season, and we approach Thanksgiving, we know that uh, the, the bigger holiday of Christmas is upon us. We've no doubt seen it in the, in the department stores and heard on the radio, and also seen on our television screens that the Christmas and holiday season are upon us. And so we begin uh, the biggest part of celebrating that uh, with Thanksgiving. And so uh, we, we plan on that. Uh, many of us have been planning at least for a, a week or two of, of what we shall do for Thanksgiving. But in today's passage from the prophet Joel, we see a different idea that we are encouraged to consider around the time of Thanksgiving. In this passage, God reveals his plans and a promise to bless the people of Judah once again. He had caused them to suffer from war and famine and destruction. And yet he promises in today's passage to Joel that if they would return to their righteous ways, that God would bless them. Now, we have a particular habit that we come to very easily in our Western minds, and particularly our America-centric minds, to read into this and believe that this is indeed about us. Now, while it may be true that if we were more righteous, uh, God would give us more blessing, uh, that's not always the case. We have also seen there are times when we as America have not been as righteous as we should, and yet we have prospered. And there are times where we have been more righteous and some of us struggle. So God chooses to give and bless as he sees fit. That's not necessarily uh, an encouragement that we should not worry about being uh, a holy nation. We, we should, but part of that holiness must begin internally in the citizens of that nation. And so, uh, of course, it's very popular and very easy for many of us to say, well, you know, if we were more righteous, God would bless us more. And that very well may be uh, true, but uh, let, let us begin being righteous personally before we worry about making the rest of the nation uh, holy. But in today's passage, connected to this promise that if, we are, that if the nation was righteous, uh, they would receive a blessing, God gives instructions on, on how to get there. And as we read in, in Joel's uh, writings, it doesn't seem to fit anything that we would imagine for Thanksgiving. In today's passage, Joel, on behalf of God, is telling the people to fast, to repent, to wear sackcloth, ashes, and mourn their wickedness. Not exactly things associated with our ideas of thanksgiving. We are well aware that thanksgiving is very often a day of excess. It's a day of eating to our heart's content and even more. We look at uh, whole tables that are full of some of our most favorite foods. And for some of us, some that are not our favorite, but they're tradition nonetheless. We see where we have a whole table full of the main foods and then a whole nother table of all the desserts. To us, Thanksgiving is most assuredly not a time of fasting. We don't typically associate those two acts together. But yet, for many, Thanksgiving is not the picture that we see. For some, they don't have families together with sometimes because of disease and death, and sometimes because of family issues, and sometimes just because people have chosen not to have large families. For some, they don't have the space to have Thanksgiving. And for some, they don't have the means to afford all the lavish celebration of Thanksgiving. 
And so, it would do us well to remember that there are those who will probably not eat as well as we do for Thanksgiving. And there are those who probably don't eat as well as we eat on just a random Thursday throughout the year. If we are to be people in a nation and we are to be holy, we would do well to help those who are less fortunate, that we would do well to be righteous by helping to serve at a community Thanksgiving dinner or to gather food for those who are less fortunate or to support local food banks throughout the year, which I'm proud to say that most of us do a good job at doing, but we could always do a little bit better. But Joel tells the people of Judah that they are to be righteous, and if they do so, the Lord will restore them. Joel tells the people of Judah that they are to be truly righteous, though. They are not just to put on a show of righteousness in order to trick God into blessing and restoring them. God gives Judah the instruction to rend their hearts and not their clothes. He tells them that it should hurt their hearts that they have sinned against him. God tells them this to remind them that it hurts God's own heart to see us so often choose disobedience and sinfulness. And so God instead tells the people of Judah through Joel that he would rather us have an understanding of the heartache he feels when we choose the paths away from him. If we would have that same attitude that he does for us, maybe we would work better on being truly righteous. If the people are truly righteous, as Joel outlines, because of God revealing it to him, he will, as God promises, restore their hearts to rightful worship and love for him. As our hearts so often become calloused and hardened, God promises a new heart with his word written upon it. We no longer have to remind each other of God's word because it is imprinted in our souls. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us and dwells in us to spur us to the right relationship with the Lord. We are to be restored as a people, but that restoration must first be personal and inward. We are able to experience that personal restoration and God's presence through the specific channels of His grace. As we are immersed in scriptural study, as we focus on meaningful and intentional prayer, and most assuredly during the time of communion where we fully experience God's restorative power in our lives. It is no accident that the words that we use besides communion and the Lord's Supper have with them a connection to the word thanksgiving. Even the word Eucharist in the Greek simply means thanksgiving. The liturgy that we as Methodists follow and is connected with many other Protestant and Reformed traditions calls the liturgy the great thanksgiving. It is a celebration and giving thanks for the blessings God gives to us. Particularly as we read in the great thanksgiving liturgy, two passages stick out in particular. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, O God. And free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ. That latter verse seems counter to anything that we would know. Free us for joyful obedience. The problem is we have been enslaved to sin and the ways of the world and wickedness for too long. And so we must pray that honest prayer of confession that we would be freed from that so that we might with joy and not sheer despair or resigned to the disobedience to God and the enslavement to the ways of the world, 
we would with joy be united in the great and good works that the Lord has intended for us. It is because of Jesus, through His life, death, and resurrection, that we can be certain that our sins are washed away and our consciences can be clean and we will experience the restoration personally as revealed in today's passage in Joel for the nation of Judah. May we give thanks for all the blessings God gives to us each and every day and especially during the day of Thanksgiving where many of us will gather with friends, family, and loved ones to celebrate all the things that God gives to us. Amen.